Okay, so I'm, ac so I'm actually not the first speaker. There is another speaker that came before me, talked about uh, Puppet and Chef. I think this is a little bit sort of related, but you know, this is the way we're developing software at Flow. So the title is Achieving a State of Flow, um, Continuous Integration and Practical Event Sourcing um, with PostgreSQL because obviously this is a Postgres conference. Um, so, so Flow is a little bit um, in psychology. It's this idea of being in the zone. So um, how do you achieve being in the zone as a developer? Um, we don't have any DevOps guys. Every one of our engineers is expected to do um, DevOps on their own so that they know how to do things. And what we, as developers, we are inherently lazy. And how do we get to you know, automate a bunch of things that, um, quite frankly, take a lot of our time? So you know, that's what the talk is going to be roughly about. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, my name is Paolo Lim. Um, I was previously an engineer at a uh, guilt group, the flash sale site. And um, more recently, I was an engineer at Blue Apron, the company that delivers uh, you know, recipes and meals to your, uh, to your door. And so the, one of the founding CTO of guilt group called me one day and said like, you know, I'm working on this new thing, are you in it? And uh, it turns out to be Flow Commerce. Um, so I was one of the founding engineers over there. What we do is try to make um, global e-commerce as simple as domestic um, everywhere. And uh, so, you know, just a little bit brief introduction to the cross-border e-commerce space. It's a really, really complicated uh, space. You have need to deal with uh, taxes, duties, shippers, customs, you know, basically a whole bunch of things that sometimes are not even online uh, globally. Um, so that's what we're doing. And I think a little bit of the joke is for all of you international teams in e-commerce, um, flow is really um, work, your workflow without the work. And that's what we're trying to do. So enough of that and um, on to my agenda for today. Um, so, you know, what I'm going to discuss um, is roughly how we do development over at Flow, and that involves um, creating a new database and managing um, schema updates to that, I th um, streamlining our local development setup, and um, event sourcing. So, you know, just a little bit of a background on how our uh, technology is at Flow. Um, we're a microservice architecture, um, mostly based on a Scala in play right now. We also have uh, Node.js for a lot of the uh, front end apps that we have. And um, a lot of the back end APIs have their own uh, databases, mostly in Postgres. And um, that gets pretty complicated when you have to manage all of that in your own local environment. And you know, say you're developing for one part of the architecture, you don't really care about having all of these other things um, necessarily in your laptop. And I'm going to take you through some examples of this a little, in a little bit. And um, event sourcing, this particular piece um, just basically means um, how, do we, how do we make sure we capture all of the application states as a, really a sequence of events. So, you know, when something happens to one of our models um, using one of the APIs, uh, how could we retrace every state it has been in for, you know, since we created it and up until deletion without, you know, really peppering too much um, the database with unnecessary fields. So I'll take you through that in a little bit. Um, and uh, I think I might have covered this already, but just as a, refresher, it's a microservice architecture, Scala Play, Node.js. Um, we, use, we use GitHub for source control. A lot of the database instances right now are in Postgres, which are deployed to uh, AWS, RDS. We use uh, Docker and Docker Hub. All of our services are on, a, all of our services are in Docker. We use the automated builds in Docker Hub and these are the ones that um, build our images and um, you know, take it from there. 
So what I really wanted to do right now is to do a little bit of a walkthrough. Um, and this way, you know, it will be a little bit more interactive and you get a little bit more of a sense of what we're doing over here at Flow. Okay. <clears throat> so over here right now, I have my, um, I have my command prompt. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do right now is to actually for those of, how many of you here are familiar with uh, the way Docker works or have worked with Docker before? Okay, so a pretty good number. Um, so right now I have no containers running in my, I have no containers running in my environment um, set up on a, on a basic Mac OS. And one of the reasons we are really bullish, we really wanted uh, to work with Docker was that the way it runs in your machine, the way the services run on the machine on my laptop over here, it's virtually the same as the way it runs in production. And that way there's, uh, there's more, you know, it's more predictable whether we could, whether when you encounter errors in production, you could easily recreate them over here. And I think one of the, one of the cool things also is that we were trying to get our, um, you know, non-engineers non to be able to run the website on their own laptops. And, um, you know, so I think one of the cool things we did was to create this uh, development tool called uh, Workstation. It basically sets up your environment with the necessary Docker containers that it needs and including all of the dependencies and actually uh, executing a bunch of health checks. <coughs> so, <coughs> and we looked at Docker Compose also, but at that time, it, we couldn't get it exactly to do what we wanted it to do, so we built a really lightweight tool around it. So um, this, one is taking, this one's taking a little bit of a while. I tried it over the Wi-Fi over here. It took about a minute or two. So, once, so what, this one is, what this one is doing is that, you know, I want to start up the website essentially on my laptop. So I do workstation, up app dub dub dub, which is essentially the website goes into our um, we have a re we have a registry which is a separate service, and sees that um, dub 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 is actually dependent on all of these other services. It requires a user service. It requires a splash page service, and those services actually depend on um, some of the some of the databases that back it. So splash page is backed by a splash page Postgres. Uh, users backed by a user Postgres, and um, you know now it's um, up and healthy. So when I do a Docker PS right now, I see a bunch of different um, uh, images that have uh, started running in my container, uh, in my in my virtual box virtual machine. And if I go back to Chrome, and um, and go to the and go to VM 6050 VM um, VM is a link to the to the IP address of a virtual box, and I'm able to run the site locally. So I do a Q123 hello.com, tell me when Flow launches, and then what I could the cool thing that I could do over here is to actually um, psql into the into the container. Um, so port, I think, I think it was, uh, I think it was 6049 and splash page DB. And then when I go over here, I should see the thing that I just created, the thing that I just created over there. So let's make this a little bit smaller so that you actually see it. Um, so this one is uh, what we feel is a pretty cool feature. If you're working, if you were working on, you know, as a developer, if you're working on one of these smaller things like our token service or our user service, and uh, you know, you just wanted everything else to work on the latest versions that are deployed to production, you could just do you could just do a workstation up app dub dub dub, and it's all there. And um, you know, right now what I wanted to do was to deconstruct a little bit of what each of these pieces actually do. I think starting with the, uh, 
starting with the Postgres one. So all of our uh, all of our Postgres all of our Postgres uh, repos are named after like the name of the app dash Postgres. Um, we follow a bunch of conventions over at Flow, and that makes um, how we that makes for what we uh, term as service discovery. Everything is by convention. Um, so over here right now, so what happens when I want to create a new repository? What do we do over here? Um, there's, nothing, there's nothing here right now. Um, and as developers, as being uh, lazy developers, what we did was to create a script to basically initialize everything for you. So, you know, I want to create a new Postgres project. I do, uh, we have this Go script that basically creates everything for you right here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that, in, that, includes, um, that includes this Docker file, which all of our Postgres repositories have. So for here, we're starting with a base image that we defined. We have a PostgreSQL base image. Um, that there's some stuff that it does over there. Some of the things that we do to actually uh, start up the schema um, and I'll take, I'll take you through this in a, in a minute about what it, actually, what it actually does, and then start the uh, Postgres container. So what we have over here is that in our, so in our scripts repository, what we wanted to do by, um, by having this managed repository for all of our schemas was that we could actually see the changed versions as they occur. And, um, and this makes it pretty easy to know that, okay, we started out um, earlier today, 420, with this first script. It was initialized with the uh, Go script. And this one basically contains a lot of the utility functions that we use to set up um, in a bunch of different places. So, so you know, I could do, um, so over here I could do a Docker build that, oops, um, let me open a Docker window. Uh, okay, so I do a Docker build of that. And um, this one is basically running through the commands that, uh, that are defined in the Docker file. So if we go through this one by one, um, so, it start, so it starts out over here with, uh, with importing the base image um, creating a bunch of uh, repositories that we, a uh, bunch of folders that we actually need. Um, and then it starts the database server. And then, after, and then after that, it goes into the scripts directory and tries to see like, okay, which, uh, which, scripts, haven't been, which scripts haven't been run yet. And uh, that one will define, um, you know, how the container actually looks like at that point. So over here right now, there's, um, so, so if I, if I, um, you know, do, Docker, actually let's not do the Docker run yet right now. So up until this point we have, um, you know, we have a Docker container. It doesn't really do, it doesn't really do anything, has a bunch of utility functions in it. But um, so, you know, that's the initial setup. So what we, one of the things that we do Say we want to add a table to the database, but we'll end up, and I have something over here already, a sample.sql. So you start out with, um, with, you start out with one of these scripts. It adds a samples table, um, basic uh, ID name and some other random field, foo. And, um, and then I call setup on that uh, table, it basically sets up a bunch of things, uh, utility functions that are related to um, to event sourcing and to uh, and to <coughs> and to uh, partitioning that I'll talk about a little bit later. So what I'll do over here is to add the script over. Um, so I'll do sem add sample SQL, and what you'll notice now is that um, it created a timestamp script at that point in time that hasn't, that hasn't been run yet. 
and then when I do another, when I do another Docker build of that, it will actually, you know, go through, go through over, go through over again. Now you can see um, I don't. Um, some of the notice stuff was in red. That's coming from Postgres, but it's basically saying, okay, I was able to build your database, and um, and uh, you know, it's successfully built, and that was great. So now what I want to now what I want to do is to go into this um, is to to go into this thing. Um, just copy one of this because I don't necessarily want to type in everything again. Um, so here, want to run want to run this image. Um, say nine 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 over there. Now this one is running in the background. What I could do is to p sql minus u api a uh, vmp nine 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 uh, demo db. So now it takes me to the shell, um, and then I could see that it actually created my um, it created my table over there. There's nothing there's nothing really in here right now, and it's just um, it's just empty that way over here. Um, so that's a little bit about um, that's a little bit about the portion over here where you know we create a database, we manage all of the schema updates, and um, basically we basically get set up with that. And so, oh, you know, take you a little bit through my slides before I get through event sourcing. So first. And this, so we create, um, usually what we end up doing at the start is to create a database in RDS. And I don't know how many of you have tried to manually configure stuff on AWS, but it's a big pain in the ass. Um, and uh, what we wanted to do was to standardize, you know, our database setup across all of our developers. So we have this uh, dev RDS script. and you know, using a few simple parameters, goes out, creates the RDS database. Um, and then that all of that management stuff that I showed you guys earlier, we're using uh, this tool called uh, Schema Evolution Manager. I have all the links later in one of the later slides to, you know, all of the GitHub repositories for these things. But for Schema Evolution Manager, basically the idea is to manage the creation of scripts and update um, the schema in, in the Postgres database. And you, know, you want a standard way for, to allow team members to contribute. And this, um, you know, each of these is SEM, uh, Schema Evolution Manager repositories, is, on, um, is internally in GitHub. They're code reviewed. And um, basically, you don't get into this issue where you know, someone Someone did something with a with a schema file, and then when you need to deploy it, um, you know something happens, brings down the site. Over here, you know you could go specifically into the into the script that introduced that change, and then you see exactly um, you see exactly what broke. So it's a way for developers to be able to contribute to the to the to the schema. And then we did a workstation, and then we did a workstation up. What we um, so review, we ended up using we ended up using Docker, um, and this one makes it predictable to run on different environments across laptops. Even our uh, business owners, um, C our CEO and our VP of uh, of customer insight, they can run this thing on their laptop, and it would just work. Like um, like it would in uh, in production, and another thing, it makes up the um, the setup of our um, uh, CI a little bit easier. I'll take you through that in a minute, and then you know you have this workstation up, goes through, figures out all of the dependencies of all the services that need to be run to show the website, and then we do that, um, and so workstation up. You bring this up; it just works. 
which we thought was um, you know, pretty nice. You don't, as a developer, you don't have to go into your own system and have to download all of the, all of the repositories and start them up, figure out what's wrong with each one of them. It's a total mess. And um, this one just makes it uh, simpler to do that. And then I did one of these demos earlier. Um, you know, you can see it just uh, it just works. I think to point out here, I don't actually need PSQL running on my laptop, but it's just for uh, demonstration purposes that um, you know I could log on to a database and it just works. So um, a little. So any um, questions at this point before I go on to the next um, topic? Okay, um, so what, one of the things that we found out about, um, uh, about uh, AWS and RDS is that, um, yeah, right, RDS, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I guess for the benefit of everyone else in the, of everyone else in the room, if you're running uh, Postgres and RDS, they have this list of um, you know, extensions that are pre-approved and you know it's a very limited set of it. So if you actually want to run, and there's one of those extensions I'll actually talk about in a minute, but you know you basically have to create create a bunch of these um, uh, tools to get around it because you, the extension that you're using may not actually be available in RDS. So right. you're, uh, Yes, right now it's living in the container, yes. You find a problematic development that that container can easily blow away and you lose your in-source bring up or you automate all of these bring up issues. Got it. Yeah. So you know that's a that's a good question. This one is right this one's right now in the in the development environment. Um, one of the th and you're correct that you know when you shut down the when you shut down the container, all of your data is lost over there. Boom, it's gone. Um, but for what we've found out, what we've found out right now is that it doesn't really hamper us that, it really doesn't hamper us that much because we're, uh, you know, we're a new, st we're a new startup. We don't have to uh, pull in production level data to get the things to work in development just yet. But one of the things that you could do is to have a data only container, where you know basically any, um, and then. And then you have your uh, Postgres container point to that, and that one is the source of its data. So that's one of the things that we would um, that would we and then you could uh, ver and then you could control and tag the versions of that uh, data only container, and that's one of the things that um, you know we could we could do in the future. And um, you know if it's really important like seed based data, then that's one of the things that you might want to actually commit also in the in the um, in the schema evolution manager scripts. So when you say data only container, that you're making use of volume and attaching the volume to the Postgres, uh, the Dockerized Postgres, uh, like you can wrap that up and then attach volume, or is that a different approach? Um, I think that's a little bit of a. I think it's it's rough it's roughly like that, um, but you but. You know, we haven't um, we haven't really we really haven't gone into it um, uh, that much. But I think the idea really is just to have you know have a container where all your all your data is, all your data is based, and then you could do things around. Um, you know, when you when you start when you start up a container, you can mount um, you can mount uh, data volumes on it, and then that one will um, and then you know it could read. Volumes from another, from another container that's already running. Okay, um, so, so, so that was a little bit of about the setup. Um, so we now go a little bit to event sourcing. So one of the, one of the things that we actually tried to solve for earlier on when we started up at uh, at Flow is this idea of event sourcing. How do we get how do we, how are we able to tell, 
um, you know, everything that happened to every row in every row in every database. And this one is driven uh, primarily out of our out of our experience at the uh, Guild Group before, where you know um, I dealt a lot with inventory management. And um, when you deal with something as important as inventory management and the auditors later on will come, uh, come to your door asking like, hey, what happened to, what happened to the, this unit of inventory? What you end up having to go through is having to go through like a big audit log. And for inventory, there's one way you do that log. And then for something, and then for something else where, you know, what happened to, when a user calls in, what happened to my order, or when, uh, or what happened to, I signed up for this email and nothing happened. There was no consistent way to record all of this uh, audits and journaling across the, um, across the board. So that's one of the things that we wanted to standardize at Flow. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of ways that we could approach it. One of them was soft deletes. This is something that we, um, that we actually did before, but we found this kind of, you know, kind of clunky. How, you know, you would create essentially a t you'd create the table. It had a deleted app field or timestamp over there, and every time you wanted to, to update, every time you wanted to update the row since it was um, immu immutable except for the deleted app field, you set the deleted app field, and then you insert something else. So that's, um, that was one of the ways that we did updates. Obviously this is, um, you know, not really the, not really the nicest, the nicest thing around because, you know, you're still thinking about, okay, I need to do this and then this other step. And then, you know, before, before you know, before you know, it, you know, once you have multiple developers, they're not, exactly on the same page about how to do these things. And then you, how can you enforce that across a um, hundred different databases later on? It's just hard to, it's just hard to do that. So, you know, um, we decided not to go, to go against that. Another idea was to create a ledger of change events. Um, so one of the, and then, you know, you have this field and then you know, there's a lot of inserts and updates, deletes maybe later, but then you can capture all of these, you could capture these things and then sort of recreate like, okay, at the start I had this, I had this insert and then here are the, um, here are the other series of events that got to there and then here's my final state right now. Um, you could do that also. What we chose to, what we ended up doing was to create more of a journal of state. So this one is mostly a uh, trigger based. So anytime we uh, insert, update, or delete a field, um, we record that in a journals, in a journals table. And then this one makes it um, a little bit easier to uh, to work about. We don't pollute the fields. In over here in my temp table, I don't really pollute pollute it too much. It um, just contains the data that I actually need. And then all of that uh, journal and ledgering stuff is in another, uh, is in a journal schema where, you know, all of the, all of the changes made happened. So I'll take you through another walkthrough over here just so that, um, you know, it gets to it gets to it gets to be a little bit clearer. So where we left off over here right now was I added was I added this new script. Um, it shows uh, basic samples and audit data. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, commit this um, samples sample schema git push origin master. That's on git right now. And I'm going back to my uh, trusty dev tool where I'm going to tag the repository. Um, I've had 11 versions of these already just because I've been um, you know, preparing for the talk. So what, this, so what this does now is that I can go, um, 
what we've set up with uh, Docker Hub over here is that you can do automated builds so it can detect uh, whenever I publish a new tag, it creates, um, you know, it creates two images. One is the, one has a tag name latest and one is just the uh, tag number. And I will get to the reason why, you, why we want latest a little bit later, but let's start with, um, you know, right now it's building two, right now it's building two images, uh, latest and, um, you know, 0011. And we do this across all of our, uh, all of our Docker containers. And um, so while this builds, I'd want to um, take, I'd want to take us a little bit um, off tangent over here. And um, that, latest, that latest tag for that uh, Docker image earlier, we could see, you know, we run all of our, uh, all of our CI on Travis. And I set up this demo this demo app, this one is a Scala, this one is a Scala play app. And um, you know, just like, just like anything else that's running in CI, it needs a database backend to actually uh, run any of these tests. So you know, what you can see here is we've set it up so that it actually looks for the, um, the Docker container from the Docker repository. And this one makes it much easier to set up like, okay, you know, I want to run, I want to run my tests in this environment. The developer shouldn't really be concerned about like, oh, do I have a, do I have a schema up and running? Do I have, um, you know, is it up to date? It just happens in the background as we uh, tag versions of the schema. So, you know, it will always, it will always come up here and then they don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, so that's where we actually use the latest tag. So let's see if it's built now. So I get the success over here for 011. Let me start up that image. So over here, demo PostgreSQL. Um, so now that that image is in Docker Hub, I use my workstation script to pull down that, uh, to pull down that image again. Um, you know, so, so if you're, if you're a developer working on the demo app and someone else is working, say on this, uh, PostgreSQL, uh, uh, schema, you don't really have to worry about it. You can just rely on the script, pull down the image. And if I go to API HVMP 6189 demo DB, all of the, all of the stuff is over here now. So now I'm ready to, um, to actually try using my sample service that I wrote. Um, so, I'm using, uh, so I'm using Postman. Um, this one basically allows me to, uh, to, write, to write a bunch of our REST, uh, REST queries against our APIs. All of our services expose a REST API. That um, that's fairly standard across the board, and um, I, let me. So the services, my local services, my local service is not running yet. Let's um, do that. Um, so say I'm running uh, this demo service and I'm doing active development on it, and um, you know, and so I run this locally. Um, and then now I could run all of these, um, all of these health checks. Let me see. Okay, let me um, change up the font over here so that it's a little bit larger. 30, say 40, okay. So 40, status is healthy. Um, so now I want to create a sample. So I post, uh, so I post a sample, um, hello and bar, and then I get this back. It was created. So, you know, we have this get endpoints, um, get the hello sample, get the this one, and then there's this, there's this endpoint over here. So, with all of our APIs, we expose a versions endpoint that ba that basically gives you. 
you know, all of the, all of the versions that have ever been created. Um, this one is, um, this one is uh, paginated. Um, we could do it like, uh, I think it's IDs. Hello. Oops. IDs hello, so I get, so this one just shows me like all of the versions for that particular ID. And um, let's say I want to do an update on it. And um, so I don't know if you could see this, I can't act, um, but you know, I'm changing the name to, to, uh, to Boo, and I'm changing the uh, foo field to hello. And let's just send that over. And then, um, you know, I receive a 200, it's okay. And then I come back over here, I'm able to see all of the changes um, as they occur. So I see that the first update was an insert and then the second, um, and then the second thing over there event was the, uh, was the update. So, um, and then you could actually see this as it happens in the database. You could see that my uh, samples, that's all of the updated, just the updated data over here. And then when I create a uh, select from journal samples, I, s <coughs> I see the actual events that occurred up until that point so that it shows, so that it shows the current state of what I'm actually doing. And so, you know, running, running something that involves running a startup that involves a lot about, um, you know, duties, taxes, uh, inventory, orders, that sort of thing. And then you're, and then you have to talk to all sorts of uh, different clients. A lot of them would want to know what happened to certain things along the way. And this one just really captures everything that we're, um, everything that we're doing up until that point. And so, you know, at some point you want to, let's say we want to delete that. I send a delete message over here. And note that um, when I try to get everything, um, you know, nothing is found. There's a little thing over there saying uh, 404, I can't see that um, thing. And then this one uh, returns, I don't have any sample models inside. Over here, I don't have anything. I don't have anything in the database, so that's uh, that's good. But then, when I go back to my versions endpoint, I think this is uh, pretty cool. Is that you could actually see at that point? It's not. It's not in the table. I can't find it. Say, okay, what happened to that? Uh, what happened to sample where the ID was hello? Well, it was deleted over there. And then, if I do go. If I do go into the database, I see it here, and then there was a there was a user ID associated with that, and that one came from the authentication header on the delete um, on the um, on the delete call. So you know everything everything is audited. Everything you know everything can be seen up to that point about you know how how it got to how it got to that state even if it's not anymore in my, um, if it, even though it's not anymore in my sample stable. And uh, so one of the things that you might, one of the things that you might say is that, well, okay, you've been running, you've been running for a while. This journal table right here could be, could get quite, quite big with all of the updates and inserts and all that. So one of the things that we, one of, one of the things that we did was to partition was to partition every journal table by month right now so every so every month there's a there's a child table in our journal for that one this one is created automatically when you do that audit that setup thing when you created the new schema earlier um, so is it a, yeah it's april now so if i go into the if I go into the April partition, I will see all of the data that I just created over there. But if I go into the one from last month, it's not there. Um, and what this enables us to do is to, you know, oh, set a policy where, 
where you know we're going to keep data for say the past three six months. Admittedly, we haven't defined what that policy is yet, but it allows you to be able to um, to set that policy and be like, okay, after six months, I'm going to throw away all of the, I'm going to purge, or you know, send it to a ba send all of the others to a backup, and then we have this uh, really lightweight uh, schema going forward monthly. So, so you know what we found very what we found very uh, useful over what we found very useful over here was a consistent way to um, to to journal everything that goes into a creator insert um, into any of our tables across all of our microservices, and um, it you know it's generally something that a lot of um, you know a lot of us I feel. Um, take for granted that flow, but it's just there. It's doing its work. It's useful when it uh, it's useful when it needs to be. So you know you don't have to worry about too much too much additional overhead aside from aside from um, aside from doing one four four three aside from doing this audit this audit setup step over here. And then everything just sort of takes care of itself after that. Um, so, so that's um, that's a little bit there. Um, so that's uh, this event journal of states. That's what that one is. Okay. Um, and here's a couple of the links to all of the stuff that were that I actually demoed that we're using. Um, the the, part, the partitioning portion. This came actually uh, really a fork version of this thing from uh, uh, Keith Fisk, who works over at um, Omni um, um, Omni DI. It's one of the sponsors of this event. Um, and then the journaling piece was something that we worked on at Guilt, and something that we are um, actively contributing to at Flow. Um, and then you could down you could download our uh, journaling, our journaling utility a little bit later when I commit the the uh, when I create the pull request for some of the changes over there. Schema evolution manager. This was written by our um, by our uh, CTO. Um, that's the one that basically con um, allows uh, multiple. Users to you know contribute to a to contribute to a database project, a Postgres project, um, in a systematic way, and then you have a way to track all of the changes that went into the schema. Um, there's a sample there's a sample repository for Postgres that um, you know the splash page PostgreSQL, which was um, used to r the back end for this. Website over here, um, so you could so you you could have a little bit of a look at it um, if you want. Um, so you know, I think that's it. Um, here's my email. You could reach me at Paolo at Flow.io. I'm on LinkedIn also. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much it. Um, did anyone have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, no, we haven't. Uh, we haven't heard. We haven't heard about Sketch, but um, so you know. I think one of the and thank you. will probably will look into that one. Um, the schema management tool that we ended up using. This one was built at a time when uh, when when at our previous company, Guilt, we were moving over from a Ruby on Rails monolith app. To a microservices, to a microservices uh, architecture. So I don't know exactly when uh, Sketch came out, but um, at around like 2010, 2011, um, when you know we sort of got used to this way of doing uh, of doing code-based migrations in Ruby on Rails. And so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but it's basically the same concept. You write a bunch of uh, Ruby scripts, they're versioned, 
and then you know the 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 gem basically looks at have I run the script before? If not, I'll go ahead and run it. And so that's sort of something that we tried to uh, do by writing our own schema management tool. And um, you know, it would be agnostic whether you are using Postgres back as a back end to Rails, to Scala. I think some other groups tried to use some other languages, but as long as it was um, as long as it was a Postgres repository, it was uh, fairly easy to use, so it gained pretty wide adoption within the, within the organization at that time. So, you know, it was pretty good. I noticed that in the journals um, table, you were able to track the updated by a user. Right. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me take you through that one. Um, it's unfortunate this doesn't get a little, this doesn't get, okay, let me, so let me run this. Let me run this again. Um, I don't know if you guys could see these, uh, these headers over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate this in curl. You could see it in the command line here. So, so what this so what this one what this one does is um, it sends an authorization token over here, um, and uh, basic and basically this ma this token maps out to a user in our database, and uh, so if I if I send if I send some, oh, let me see. So if I send something that actually, that actually doesn't exist, this one should return a 401, it's unauthorized. It was able to figure out that, um, that this token was invalid, it doesn't map out to our user in a database. So for the earlier one, it maps out to a user in the database, we get that user ID, and um, and then if you notice over here, what we do is to set the updated by user ID over here in the samples database. And what the journaling essentially does is that it sees this row, gets a copy of this row, and then um, and then puts it into the journal table. And so it just really copies this row puts it directly there, it doesn't do anything else aside from that. Okay, so the application sets the updated by user ID on the main table. Right. And then the trigger doesn't have access to any of, that, any of the authorization token or anything about the application, it just looks at that. Right, yes. It, it, just, does, it just does that, yes, that's correct. So I have um, five min well, a little less than five minutes left, so you know, does anyone else have any other questions? Um, no, we haven't. Um, it was one, it's, so it, like a uh, sketch, it's one of those things that we didn't actually uh, uh, hear about just yet. So, you know, for some of, for some of these things, they came about at the time when, you know, there weren't a whole lot of tools yet. So we essentially built our, our own uh, open source tools around it, but yeah. Um, I think that's a good question. Uh, right, right now we haven't run into any issues with um, we haven't run any, into any issues with timestamps yet. But you know it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about um, you know if you did run into issues around these things before, what what they actually were. Right. 
screwed up. Okay. Got it. I think for one of the things that you actually mentioned, we do have um, we do have a select from journal that samples. Um, we do have this updating field journal .id over here, and then that one is um, that one is just a sequence of integers. So, not sure if that one actually helps, but you know. Um, I think it's a little bit uh, close to what you were actually saying. Okay. 